the Holy Spirit, come, come as the wind and cleanse, come as the fire and burn, convert and consecrate our lives for our great good and for your greater glory. For we ask it in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. You may be seated. It is a great joy to be here with you as the 14th Bishop of South Carolina for this time of confirmation, to be here with your clergy and uh, to celebrate with them what God is doing in this congregation. If you'd had a different translation read of that second letter of Paul, it would have begun this way. For the love of Christ controls us. For the love of Christ controls us. The love of Christ in us and our love for Him controls us. Everyone in this world is controlled by something. Sometimes it's many different things conflicting within ourselves. That was the case with this man whom Jesus met on the far side of the Sea of Galilee. He was controlled by many dark, conflicting voices and drives and obsessions. Dark spirits were at work in his life, causing him to be beside himself, to flagellate himself, to beat himself, to drive himself, obsessed with many voices echoing within his soul. Everyone is controlled by something. Years ago, a great Christian once said that what the heart desires, the will chooses, and the mind justifies. What you have in your heart that desires, what it desires, your will will eventually choose and your mind will go to work to justify what your will has chosen and your heart wanted. That is the reason why the prophets of Israel said, I will take out your heart of stone that is resistant to me, that rebels against me, and is unresponsive to my law and my word, and I will give you a heart of flesh, and I will write my law upon your heart that you might follow me from within. Because you see, until the heart is dealt with, all the wrong things control us. If you ever wonder why it is that, that someone you know who seemed perfectly reasonable, rational, loving parent, suddenly in the midst of, of life, leaves children and spouse, gets in a car, a Corvette, and drives off to California, or if they live in California, drives off to South Carolina, <laughs> forsaking everything, having life upon life upon life fall in in destruction, and you meet them a year or two later, and they absolutely justify everything they did because they were in love, then you begin to understand what he meant when he said what the heart desires, the will chooses, and the mind justifies. So if God is going to do something with us, he's got to get the heart reconciled to himself. That is the great problem of the world. Hearts unreconciled to God and desiring all sorts of conflicting things. Some years ago I was in England for an Anglican consultative council meeting. And after the, the meeting was over, I had a few days in London, so I went to visit St. Paul's Cathedral. You know, that great piece of architecture by Christopher Wren. And having appreciated that for several hours, I, I came out of, the, of, the, of the St. Paul's Cathedral and I still had a few hours left in the day. 
And I looked across the Thames River and I saw the Tate Museum of Modern Art. So I thought, you know what? I'll go over there. There was every kind of ism you can imagine in there. <laughs> Modernism, realism, surrealism, pointillism, feminism, every ism you can think of. And every ism trying to replace the other ism uh, in this avant-garde life. And you know you're in for a boundary-expanding experience when Pablo Picasso and Matisse are the tradi traditionalists in the exhibit, you see. I mean, there was uh, Andy Warhol's silk screens of Elvis Presley and Marilyn Monroe all the way to Marcel Duchamp's autographed toilet bowl. There they were. All speaking of the estrangement, the alienation of modern contemporary culture. The most stunning example of alienation was a bar relief done by a woman sculptor and there was a video describing how she did it. It was a bar relief with all these colors splattered all over the place. Well, the colors got there because after she did the bar relief, she got a rifle and shot paintballs of different colors at it. She said, I wanted to kill and destroy every institution, every school, every church, every family, every father, every child. Because I was so angry. No wonder the Apostle Paul, maybe he wasn't exaggerating when he said, you who were once estranged and hostile in mind, doing evil deeds. He, Christ, has reconciled in the body of his flesh through his death in order to present you holy and blameless and irreproachable before him. You see, until we are reconciled to God, we're a mass of conflicting desires controlled by various things at disparity with one another. And we wind up hurting even those we love because we're controlled by so many different things and we cannot control ourselves. But Paul says we are controlled by the love of Christ. We have been reconciled to God. Now, I suppose most of you don't bear the, the same kind of alienation that many of those contemporary artists ex expressed in their art that I saw in the Tate Museum, but I, I, I guarantee there's, there's a need for reconciliation in most of the lives here today. And it might be that kind of reconciliation that, that is needed is, is the kind of estrangement that was in that little Midwestern town where there lived a, a clerk who, who was so industrious, as a young man he was able eventually to buy the hardware store in which he worked. He married and, and had two sons, identical twins. These twins were so close to one another, they always wore the same clothes, they went to the same school, the same classes. After they graduated from high school, they went off to the same college. And after college, they moved back to their hometown and worked with their father in the hardware store, which was the center of this little community because everyone came in there sometimes buying things just to go there so that they could be there and drink coffee and talk. Well, when the father died, the two sons inherited the store. And everyone spoke about these two brothers as a perfect example of business cooperation. The whole town just saw them with such a sense of pride. Well, one day... A customer came into the hardware store to buy something. 
It was a small purchase of about five dollars. The one brother waiting on him took the five dollar bill, put it on top of the cash register rather than in the till, and as they do in those places in that time, he walked the customer out to the front door talking and chattering away about the weather and other things. Forgot all about the five dollar bill. The other brother busy stocking things in the bin. The, the brother remembered about the five dollar bill and he went back to put it in the till and it was gone. He called to his other brother and, and, and said, did you by chance see that five dollar bill that was on top of the cash register and put it in the till? The brother said, no, I've been stocking these items all day long. I haven't seen anything. If he'd left it at that, it would have been fine. But a little bit later in the afternoon, he goes back to the brother and says, are you sure you did not see that $5 bill and put it in the till? And the brother, hearing a slight insinuation of dishonesty, responded in kind and said, I told you, I didn't see it. I've been stalking things all day. Well, the whole relationship began to unravel from that time on. Within a month, they had divided up the store, built a wall right down the middle of the, of the building, and each brother opened his hardware store up in his own name, and all the community had to decide who they would patronize. Their alienation began to spread throughout the entire town. This went on for 20 years. After some 20 years, this alienation spreading and rippling down through, through children and grandchildren, why, a stranger came to town, pulled up in front of one of the stores with an out-of-state license, walked into one of the stores and asked the clerk if he could see the owner. Out comes this elderly man, and the stranger says, Sir, uh, how long have you owned this store? He says, I've been an owner in this store from as far back as I can remember, 30, 40 years. The stranger said, Then you're someone I need to deal with. Some 20 years ago, I was down on my luck riding a train. I hopped off in your town and I was hungry and had no money and I was walking by the back of your store down the alley and I saw the back door opened and I saw a five dollar bill on the on the cash register and though I'd been raised a Christian so hungry was I that I went in and I saw that everyone was in a different part of the store and I took the five dollars but since I was raised as a Christian that has been haunting me all these years and I swore one day I'd get back here and return the five dollars and all the interest that would have accrued. Here's two hundred dollars. And the man that he was speaking to, tears running down his cheeks. He said, would you go next door and tell that story to the man who owns that store? So the old man and the, str and the stranger walk into the next store and there the stranger sees two men looking almost identical one to another. He unfolds his story, both men looking down at their shoes, tears running down their cheeks. For the stranger coming to pay a debt reconciled two brothers to himself and through them an entire community. You see, this whole thing of reconciliation strikes at the heart of who we are. So Paul says in today's reading, God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. Oh my, you know, this is Father's Day. 
And there are a lot of unreconciled relationships between fathers and children in this world. And mothers and daughters, for that matter. But it strikes at the heart of who we are and causes deep, profound conflict when we are unreconciled with our Heavenly Father, our earthly Father, ourselves. For until we are reconciled, we are a mass of conflict within our hearts, you see. Paul, in this letter today, he's talking about how to get a fresh start. How to have the slate wiped clean. How to be reconciled to God, to yourself, and to others in your life. And through that reconciliation, then becoming ambassadors of reconciliation in the world. But he's got to get the heart, which is a mass of conflict, until the love of Christ controls us. So Paul says, I appeal to you, I implore you, this day, be reconciled to God. For he made Christ to be sin who knew no sin, that we might know the righteousness and the reconciliation of God. Or he made, he put our wrong on him who knew no wrong, that we might know the rightness of God and we might be at peace within ourselves and with him. So I beg you, be reconciled. Now, in every act of reconciliation, everybody brings something. And let me tell you what you need to bring. You need to bring your unreconciled lives, your alienation, your brokenness, your angers, your resentments, your sin, the deep pains of your heart, and you bring them forward. And you do this if you want, during the communion service, and you put them as an empty hand to God, lifting them to Him. That's what you bring to the relationship. He brings His love, His forgiveness, His healing, His transforming power through Jesus Christ symbolized in the bread of heaven that you will consume. You bring your emptiness. He brings the fullness of his love that you might be reconciled to him this day. It's a deal, I mean to tell you. There's not a merchant in Myrtle Beach offering a better deal than this today that you bring nothing but your brokenness and your debt and your sin and your estrangement and your alienation and your relationships all skewed by your conflicting desires. And he brings the grace of God that begins to put you into a place where you can start afresh. For if anyone is in Christ, He is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. So that's what, that's the deal. It's offered. And you need to receive it. It's the best deal you'll ever make. And then he will take you And by his grace, make you an ambassador of reconciliation in the world. So that you may, by chance, need to make a phone call to someone that you are not reconciled with. 
and be the channel of his grace in a broken world. Like those two brothers in that Midwestern town who decided that, that day when the stranger came to tear down the wall and let their relationship be healed and the community by their healing grace heal their town. Oh my, this is a deal. Don't reject it. Let us pray. Lord God, Heavenly Father, on this day that we have called Father's Day, we pause to say thank you. That you so loved the world that you gave your only begotten Son that whosoever would believe in him would not perish but would have eternal life. That you, Father, were in Christ reconciling the world to yourself and allowing us to be ambassadors of your reconciling love in the world. Grant us this day, Lord, the grace of your Holy Spirit poured upon us, touching deep within our hearts, bringing us to peace and in right mind, in right relationship with one another and with you, that you might send us out into the world to be agents of your reconciling love to others, having been reconciled ourselves. These things we ask in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.